Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to a Morris Federation online event. Uh, my name is Pauline Woods Wilson, and today we have Doc Rowe taking us through a nice romp through his back catalogue. Um, over to you, Doc. You will need to unmute yourself, though. Unmute. I thought I was awfully sorry. Have I got to say all that again? I've even forgotten what I said now. Um, yeah, I know <clears throat> you, you said, um, uh, I mean, I normally say it's a troll through because I, I just throw a net into this huge bin and pull out stuff and I surprise myself. Uh, and, and in fact, <clears throat> as some of you will know, I'll probably surprise myself with what comes up because it's been a while just throwing stuff in together. And, and I'm not going to apologize. It's, um, it's not um, narcissistic, but it is very, very personal. This it's looking at me uh, starting off and plundering through, and I, I suspect there's a few people I can see already are going to appear in this as well. So uh, let me just share the screen, which we had difficulty doing, first of all. I can't find the button. Right, sharing screen. Okay. Are we on? All right. As I say, this is going to be a little bit of a trawl through. This was a graphic I did for um, Dirt <coughs> 2003, I seem to remember. But I'm going to go back to when I was young. I was young once. Um, no, not that young. Um, so in the early 60s, uh, I was interested in traditional music. I grew up in Devon. And uh, I always say one of the things that inspired me is in the in the mid to late 50s, I was listening to the, the wireless, as it was then, and uh, listening to, on the Sunday mornings, I seem to remember, a programme called As I Roved Out. And this introduced us to loads of traditional and folk song of uh, the, the British Isles and elsewhere. And um, what what upset me, what annoyed me, even at that young age, was the fact that they seemed to be saying that all this material had died out, that the, the songs were no longer there. And it was only courtesy of the BBC that we were able to uh, hear this stuff. And, and I had wandered over Dartmoor, and uh, I've run into various performers, singers, and so on. And <clears throat> in in South Taunton and South Hill and Sticklepath, they, 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 where they still have Dartmoor Festival now, they were step dancing. And so I set out one day to find this man called Bob Can, who I'd heard of. And I went into this local pub, and the landlord said to me, uh, I think I was under drinking age even then, um, <clears throat> And he said to me, well, Bob comes in usually about 5.30. I think this was about one o'clock in the afternoon. And I hung around and um, with great delight, he showed me the table that Bob stepped on with the scratch marks on the on the top of the table. So this man is, is somebody I had to meet. In fact, I didn't meet him that day, but um, uh, a month or two later, I did run into him. And there he is playing his honer uh, uh, squeeze box back to front, I suddenly realised. Um, <clears throat> print, printed around the wrong way. And he became a very close and old friend. Uh, and again, recorded him. Uh, didn't record him stepping, unfortunately, but um, lo lots of photographs of him. And again, wandering back. I, I didn't drive then. I, I, have, I don't drive now. So it was quite an arduous task to get across Dartmoor. But somehow I managed it. I don't know how. It's probably the, the luck of the thumb and nice people being about. But started to um, 
note down more than actually document as I do now, but it came later, the fact that you should get a tape recorder. And my very first tape recorder, I remember, I bought from a, a shop next door to the pet shop in Torquay. And it was purple and purple and grey made in Taiwan. And um, and had no capstan, so everything came back and we got it very slow in different speeds because it really depended on the the power of the uh, the battery. But I was um, I was a bit of a political animal. I was I was in the CND, buying the Morning Star, um, joining the marches and learning songs off there. But at the same time, and I don't think it was May Day that attracted me. I was an art uh, art college in Newton Abbott in 1962. And somehow I managed to get down to Padstow for this May Day. And I suspect it was probably one of the uh, other singers in, in, the, uh, in the Newton Abbott Folk Club that took me down. But I honestly can't remember. But what I found there was the most extraordinary, um, emotional, passionate, you know, expression of a, a, a real community coming together on that day. And I always say I went back in 1964 because I couldn't believe what, what I'd seen. Um, and there I met uh, Charlie Bate there. Uh, <clears throat> I think that's pretty the wrong way around as well, actually. I'm suddenly conscious of all this. Um, yeah, Charlie Bate. And, and on the, on the right-hand side, some of you might recognise Louis Killen, who came down there for, for, for that one occasion. But, but more of that later. I'll just show you a quick clip. And hopefully the, I've reduced the quality of this, so it should actually play reasonably well. This is um, the blue ribbon os just going into the tea. <laughs> As you say, it's a vernacular dance, I'd say, rather than anything that's um, choreographed. But um, more of that later. Uh, one of the other key things, and, and it's, uh, I, I feel I need to mention it here, was actually meeting up with BBC radio producer Charles Parker, who had been producing the radio ballads with Ewan McColl and Peggy Seeger. Uh, and he was a great great influence on me. I mean, my mentor, really. Uh, and actually... Um, uh, I suppose I developed a credo, if you like, about the use of uh, modern media to document this stuff. But that's, as they say, another story. Um, I I did the usual troll of people who began interested in um, in folklore and traditions by reading James Fraser, and I think very very quickly realised this was uh, almost. Um, well, not, not exactly nonsense, it was an extraordinary amount of stuff, but of no relevance at all. And, and trying to echo back to a, a, a past that didn't exist here at all. And, and as you swatted further and went through the books, you found these fanciful images of, of Merry England. Um, Daily Mirror, this, this I, I don't know if people know this, but it's the Daily Mirror ran a piece in, in the 1930s. Um, and I'll show each panel in time. One England was merry, and shoemakers sang at their last. Joining the chorus. The English Folk Dance and Song Society does not seem to despair of the habit of dancing. And singing becoming natural to English people once more. What a hope! But it was clear that Morris dancing and and folk music, this is 1934, so some years earlier, um, <clears throat> with the, uh, I suspect, Bampton actually dancing at the Albert Hall. Uh, and there was a, uh, obviously, 
a cold or flu epidemic, but people were aware of Morris. Now oh, there we are, it's the EFDSS at the Albert Hall. Now, the other thing that happened, I'm still down in Devon, I'm still a, a youngish man, and these, these books that I was buying, you had to go to rare places, and there was a wonderful bookshop in Exeter that sold me songbooks and folklore books, or well, fake law books, presumably, but um, they also sold photographs, and this was one of Headington Quarry that I bought for, I only think, about 10 shillings. And on the back was this a group of Maurice dancers, three nine. And I, I, I seem to remember that Mike Heaney told me that this was a rare photograph that it may not even appear in the in the set in Oxford. So we need to perhaps if Mike's there today, I seem to see he was signing up to actually check that one out. But similarly, I also bought this, which at the time I didn't know about, but it turns out to be um, Bidford Morris, the, the, the creation of Darcy Ferris, who is the man on the, um, the cart uh, pretending to be the Lord of Misrule. And Darcy Ferris, or de Ferris as he was, um, was the pageant master of England at that time. And he, he in one of Victoria's, I think it was 1881, uh, one of Victoria's many celebrations, he decided to do a, a, a Morris event. He created the Morris team. He looked for uh, ancient or even medieval Morris dancing tunes. And it seems that he couldn't find anyone, <laughs> surprise. So he made them up himself, but he didn't tell anyone. So within years these these um uh these tunes and dances had gone down as being quite ancient and the only the pictures the engraving that was taken from that which again is a, an artist's recreation is the one that um most people know uh and i remember showing that image to roy judge who in his own words nearly wet himself because it was a photograph he hadn't seen and I have a wonderful letter from him saying, yummy, 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 yours, Roy. It was so good. So there was the Bidford team later on. And, and additional to that as well, which um, I only recently realised, because uh, it was uh, something else that this Lord of uh, this um, uh, Master of the Revels put on was in Fountains Abbey up in Yorkshire a revel, and there he was by command of Darcy Ferris, master of ye revels. I later discovered that, um, to my worry really, that he moved to Padstow and he was actually an organist in the church uh, choir until he died. He died in London, in fact, not in Padstow. So, but uh, it did worry me slightly because I thought maybe all that that extraordinary um, decoration and obios and things like that may have come from his construct. But I, I'm satisfied now that, that it was way before his time. Um, at that time as well, I I, I knew of. Cecil Sharp House in London, and I went up there, I think 62 or 63. Um, I remember that my, my signature in the book, the, mem the, the signing in book, followed Princess Margaret's and the Spinners. So it'll be worth going back to 1962, 63 and seeing that. And of course, I expected, as many of us did, I think, that we would see Cecil Sharp House as Cecil Sharp's house as a kind of cottage with woodbine and ivy going round the door, not looking like a, um, a telephone exchange as it is. But in those days, the library was not quite as... Um, domestic as this but it was it was there we had flowers on the table and so on um and 
I think it was Elizabeth Noyes was the librarian. And I, I used to go there whenever I was in London. And when I moved to London as a, as a student, uh, I used to go in there every Tuesday night to, to write a, a thesis on, on folk music, which never got done. Um, and again, the, the fanciful images, uh, you know, I was searching, looking for M Morris dancers, the hobby horse, and we got this based on the Betley window, of course. Um, and even the Morris dancers bore no relationship to uh, uh, what I'd seen elsewhere. But I did discover Bill Kimber in his youth and, and later. Um, I'd, met, um, I'd met Headington briefly. Hang on, it seems to have frozen up. Um, yeah, I, somebody's trying to enter. Um, yeah, I met Headington briefly, and I can't remember where, because I'd been to Bampton in in the in the mid late sixties. And again, the lovely images. This is uh, you, you, you people have seen the Padso Obios. Uh, this was in one of the um, AA touring books, uh, purporting to be. Uh, Padstow dancing in fancy dress and so on. Nothing at all like the obvious that was there. And of course, oh, the, 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 the other one, but that's another story, as you say, uh, was the um, Ilmington Oss, which, which developed from um, Darcy Ferris's influences. But it, the other thing that happened at Sells Sharp House was um, Dave Bland was actually in the library at that time. and. I copied a lot of the glass plates that were there that they hadn't hadn't been seen otherwise. So these were one or two. Which led me on to other things. Again, you know, following up and realizing the um the history. There's there's Sharp collecting at Winster. And one of the things I did was to, uh, again, copy the negatives and some of the prints of sharp singers. There's just a few of them here, but they're extraordinary document. And as I say, I went, I went to Bampton. This is a later version of that uh, with, with Francis Shergov. And all of these people say, why do you go back? You've got the photographs already. And it is nothing to do with that. It's actually meeting the people. It's a social element. Uh, and what then comes out of it, of course, is um, the, the history that, that develops and you see the change, you know why there's a change and so on. And that's what I think I've been doing um, but very casually. Uh, and I met Reg Hall, um, who also flows through this uh, this little uh, troll as well, play, playing the fiddle. And amazing dancers. And thanks to um, Keith Chandler, um, he sent me some photographs, these are around 1949. Uh, colour ones, which is quite surprising because you, you normally see these as black and white. And I've recently started digitising some of the stray films that I've got in the collection. I have absolutely no idea with, this is edited of course, just to cut it down, but this is Bampton in 1962. That's what it says on the tin. Um, and if anyone has any idea who may have shot it, I'd be delighted. It's about 30 minutes. So I'm just showing you one or two minutes of this. And of course, it's mute. It's a eight mil. I'm just waiting for the appearance of Reg Hall. And there he is. I sent a copy of this to Reds the other day, actually, and he's uh, come back with a few suggestions.
right, so if anyone has an idea and 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 uh, there was step dancing in in the pub as well this again is in the in in bampton anyone like to try that these days and again stray footage i found in the in the collection this is abbas bromley in, in, the, in the good old days where there were just children and a boy and a dog on a bike um and the stray policeman appears so in the early days you felt almost like an explorer you know uh, nowadays you feel more like a tourist and these were the old costumes I'm just waiting for a little clip that comes up and Derek and a few others I noticed Derek was here will recognize this at, at, at the farm which has now got a glass uh, window in the front there and the only people there were children a policeman and a boy on a dog a boy on a bike rather no dog This was this after Padstow. This was the, the the second place that I went to, and I started going there properly in 1973, and I've been there practically every year since. Um, costumes have changed. Let me just see if we got it. And and one one of the things that's happening in Padstow was actually collecting the the older photographs uh, locally from people. And, and then going back with a tape recorder and using these photographs as a catalyst, if you like, to uh, to promote sort of memory and recollection of the different things. But and a quick clip of what Albert Bromley might look like today. I downgraded that a little bit too far. But, um, I'd just like to make a comment here. This is Jeff Bradbury, one, one of the one of the main dancers who danced with them for 50 years. He died two years ago, very sadly. He was a very close friend. And um, I'd just like just to pay tribute to him, really. Uh, two years ago, when the dancers came out, they, they actually stopped. The, they, they came out of the church and went straight to the grave, Jeff's grave, and uh, paid a homage to him. So, one of the one of probably the most photographed of the dancers i think you know um again same time i went to um I, i'm obviously looking at dance particularly would could you believe because of the uh, uh the federation but i i went to abingdon uh large team and what one of the aspects there of course is is the election of the mayor of oxford and uh, let me just show you after they've it's a proper vote voting system people in Oxford get a voting form and they have to tick the box and one of the Morris dancers who's been uh, put up for, for mayorship um, actually becomes mayor and he's then ceremoniously carried down the street oh and there's Bert Cleaver there on the pipe and tabor many of you know him You notice that the uh, the ox's head has got 1700 on, <clears throat> and the story goes that in in the year 1700, there was a the bullock that the horns were taken from was roasted in the in the square, and um, there were two rival factions 
in the community who wanted the horns as a souvenir. And it said that one family, the Hemmings, they, they drew lines between the, the, uh, the two pubs in Oxford and they put the horns in the middle and the, the, the competing pair would then attack each other. And as the story goes, uh, one of the Hemmings uh, had a, a, well, a branch, someone said it's you know, a club, um, went in, socked everybody about and ran off with the horns. And it then was carried in um, as a kind of taunt against the, 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 the ruling class end of the town by the Morris dancers every year. This is what they do. Um, about this time, Peter Pilbeam, who was BBC radio producer doing the folk programme, uh, folk weave, I think. Uh, he got in touch and he somehow learned that I was regularly at uh, Abingdon and would I consider doing a radio programme. So I spent about a year recording a lot of the older members of the uh, community, uh, the older dancers, not that old, and, um, and I put together a, a radio programme. But in doing that, of course, researching as one does very casually, we discover that Mary Neal had been there uh, and issued in the, oh dear, I've run, shrunk that too far. Um, <clears throat> uh, and she wrote to Mrs. Hudson at the Happy Dick Abingdon on Thames, that is the envelope. And this is the letter to Mrs. Hudson, which I want to give to uh, Sales of Sharp House at some point. I went, I went to record uh, the son of Mrs. Hudson, um, who kept the Happy Dick, which is, was the headquarters of the, the Morris dancers. Quite nice reading. It says um, at the bottom, I should like them to ensure the horns at the station, as they have to be taken great care of. I am sure you will talk to them with something I can't read it because uh, oh not having any beer until after the concert because it is too important and so little upsets them which is a lovely <coughs> they shall have so much supper afterwards it reminds me of uh, uh, several incidents that occurred to Bampton Morris going to Cecil Sharp House and turning up the worse for beer Oh, and that's another note again. Sorry, I've, I've, uh, I've increased it. I have the concertina of Mr. Hemmings. So he, the, the, not leaving this. He, oh, yes, he had, we have the horns, the cap and the sword. So she's taken that in advance to London for fear they might lose them, I think. And the, the radio documentary I did, it was very much, you know, people's um words with the music and the uh, it was a long title in the year 1700 a bullock was roasted uh and that was on 21st of june 1979 i discovered yesterday and again i said earlier that a lot of this is social you do meet the most extraordinary people uh, and one of those was this guy colin corner who, although a Liverpudlian, he joined Abingdon at a time where the, the, it was it becoming rather delicate. They couldn't get the dancers, and um, he was uh, he was he was their own worst enemy or his own worst enemy, really. But it, it's thanks to him, and another story should be told. Thanks to him that the uh, the modern team continues, I think. And similarly. I mentioned this man before, not the one on the right, but Keith Chandler, who is a very good friend, who has, has been documenting the, the Morris thoroughly over the years and is, is the, the person to go to. Similarly, Roy Domit, who many will, you know, um, became a good friend. We used to share lots of, um, <laughs> lots of mutterings and notes together. And there's Roy with the aforementioned Colin Corner, probably the last time they saw each other and probably the last time I saw them as well, sadly. 
And again, talking of um, uh, characters, uh, there on your right hand side is the Reverend um, Kenneth Lovelace, who appears everywhere. I, yes, that, that picture reminds me. I, I, I used to do strange things at these events like escapo underwater escapology, escaping from chains and, and fire eating. And uh, one of the stunts was actually hammering a six inch nail up my nose. And Kenneth was at one of these and very close to me. And he leaned over and he said, God moves in mysterious ways. And so do you, stupid boy, stop it at once. Um, and about this time as well, many of you remember the first, I think it was 1979, the first um, Dancing England occurred. Uh, I, I couldn't find any, any, anything of this, but I did an exhibition there. And Bill Tidy, who again, very sadly died about two weeks ago, uh, he did this um, cartoon of me because uh, he heard that I, I, I went Somebody, he asked them, did I go around following all these things? And they said, he's more likely to be in front, about to be run over by a bus that he hasn't noticed coming. And um, so he drew this, and there's me about to fall down a manhole. But given that I used to carry all this to, uh, to events, it's, um, you know, <laughs> it, it was what a bit of a strain. Anyway, back to Padso. Um, probably the most important uh event in my life um i went there i went back again i went again i've been going in fact this year has been my 60th year and uh, i missed once when i was out of the country but i was just taking photographs and noting people um and again using the old photographs and collected quite a few and a lots of um stories and tales and there was a, a local magazine called Padstow Echo which came out regularly about two or three times a year and Margaret Brenton who was the the person that ran it uh, ran into debt she was about 200 and 250 quid out and about to close the magazine so I suggested I I do a special issue of the Echo and um, the idea was to sell it for cost price to the locals and a pound to any um, any uh, visitors on May Day. And so that's what I did. Uh, there's me copying photographs. Again, uh, I, I would never take photographs away, always copy them on the spot. And that word went round because people then realised that they were safe. I just noticed those flares. Oh, eh? gosh, I might still have those. Um, so you know taking photographs on the spot it, it meant that f frequently people allowed you to look at photographs that they wouldn't have otherwise allowed out you know and so i produced this book called as you see well call once more to your house and it was a statement photographs old and some of mine from new ones but all the text was actually drawn from um recordings of people looking at the photographs so and i think that's a wonderful quote that was from a chap called tom stone he said it'll never die out he won't be there to see it but it will never die out and so there must be a, a grammatical term for that kind of phrasing but that's what it did and um we sold sold a thousand in 45 minutes on may day it was on 1982 rather a worry um it's that bad again <laughs> Reverend Kenneth, um, I had, I, I met up with the Morris Ring at odd times, and this was uh, one of the ring meetings in Birmingham. And in 1984, they had their, uh, their, their anniversary, uh, the 50 years, and they, the powers of B, uh, like the format of the Padstow book, so they, they got me to do one exactly the same size. Um, but of course, I didn't have the, uh, they didn't have the, the, uh, the words of people. So I was using the old photographs and uh, hopefully wrote correctly, although 
I do know that one or two of the photographs, because they went to a printer, I did the layout, but the photographs got juxtaposed with the wrong text. So if anyone has got it, they might actually realise, well, they would know that uh, some of them had the wrong text. And uh, I, again, did drawings, and, and one of them took the, uh, the, the ring's fancy and said, could we use it again? And would you organise an event? And this was November in the same year, 1984, was going to be, hear the word, was going to be held at the Octagon in Sheffield. I was then living in Sheffield. Uh, you can see on the side there that it was going to be a pound, an adult two pounds, one pound fifty. Extraordinary. And we we had contact with all these dancers. So it was all set up about a year before. And um, unfortunately, in February of the year, 1984, I don't know which member of the Morris Ring uh, got cold feet and felt that they hadn't taken enough sales. So they cancelled it. And you can see what, what extraordinary event that would have been had it come off. And, and I do feel that it was a bit early in February to decide that it wouldn't have happened. Malcolm Taylor, who many of you will know, um, I met him on his second day at Cecil Sharp House Library and saw him as a nice young man as he was. And I thought he wouldn't last a fortnight how wrong I was and uh, how pleased I was. But we, we did quite a lot together. Again, I did, um, you've seen those pictures before, but um, I did a lot of the uh, artwork for uh, the various books they produced. We also produced um, uh, education resource packs, one for May, one for midwinter, and um, Plow Monday to Hocktide. Interestingly, we never got to August, September and October. I have a feeling it's because October, November would have run into uh, those, um, those uh, the Halloween period, which a lot of people um, started to rather like the blackface is happening now. They were rather fearful of actually entertaining it. But the May one also um, had a Morris poster and uh, in fact, I've got one here, which I'll show you in a minute. It was a, a large A A three poster, and the green. I'll tell you now. We went to the printer, and he had pots of green ink left over from doing a Lloyd's Bank publicity campaign, and if we used that, it would cost us nothing. So guess what? And there's, uh, uh, again, I put this in, Malcolm and I, he um, he did a, a, a program, uh, an archive hour on me in 2006. And I thought that was rather nice that the contributors are at the bottom there, unknown dot row, unknown Malcolm Taylor. But I'd say we'd, we'd have um, some straw as well. So we've got this straw bear here, which Brian Kell, um, Oh, it's beginning to slide, I don't know. Nothing to do with me, honest. Anyway, yeah, so Brian Kell set this up many years ago. I think it's 40th anniversary coming up. And um, I knew him very well in Padstow. And for some reason, he thought I was a purist and decided not to tell me about this. And it was one of his friends that one day said, you've not been to our event. Um, and I think Brian was rather surprised and delighted that I didn't didn't scream. Um, I thought it was brilliant. And somewhere there's a photograph of me and my first visit being embraced by this straw bear. It's, uh... <laughs>
Again, we've seen the, <laughs> the wonderful um, reports of customs and, and dance. We've, um, it's getting increasingly more interesting now, as you know, but recent uh, interest in, in folklore and fake law. But this, this one was a jolly one. We've not only got Britannia coconut dancers, which they've got the, um, the detail right, and the Abbot's Bromley horn dancers at the bottom, or it's symbolic of an ancient deer ceremony, it says here. Um, the, um, the one on May the 1st is interesting because it says if you go to Minehead in Somerset, and very clearly it's the uh, Padstow Oss. That was in the Jackie magazine. There's other magazines I find things in. This is uh, Abbott's Bromley Horn Dance, and I think that probably, you know, <laughs> prob probably more um, uh, more authentic than anything else. And Banksy as well, you know, Boris dancing appears. And I say, clearly people know what Morris dancing and, and May Day is, because this was a, an advert for Skull many years ago. I don't know if you remember it, but that's did you enjoy your May Day celebrations? And it says, don't ask. <laughs> that was a gathering at um, Trafalgar Square when um, dear, uh, what was he called? Gosh, my mate, and I can't think of his name, the MP um, who declared that, that three three musicians in a bar was was unholy welcome, and so we we petitioned and went to the uh, the, the cultural secretary and and similarly, uh, this is Winston Morris. And they appeared on an advert. Oh. Over 13 million British adults have experimented with drugs. Drugs Uncovered, a 64-page magazine, free with The Observer this Sunday. I ask you. Right, how are we doing? I think... Um, yes, shall I, uh, shall I stop there? I think uh, people... I mean, hundreds of others, but... Uh, let me just stop. Oh, carry on a bit more. Carry on a bit more. <laughs> well, I'm not quite sure what there is. This is mine here, Dobby. So again, dance tradition. Hold on, you've stopped screen sharing. Have I? Mm. Well, I'm enjoying it. Yeah. <laughs> All right, okay. This could be interesting. Uh, Diddly, diddly, diddly. No. Right. It's telling me this is a free version, not for commercial use. What? I've lost you actually. Ah, there we are. Oh, there's people out there. Hello, people. What do you want to do? Do you want to do a bit Sorry, more? I've got a oh, we're right there. Okay, cool. Or not, as the case may be. Right, these are so uh, random. Uh, Earl of Rome ceremony again, the dance there developed. Uh, it was a. Um, <clears throat> Uh, a recreation of something that only had a page in a in a journal many years before but the the, uh, 
the Earl of Roan is shot down off the Oss, but the dance itself, the, the, the Obby Oss is a kind of hybrid between Padstow and Minehead, but the dance itself is, is um, it, it's rather like um, a scissor effect. One line moves once one way across the street and the other, the other. It's, it's rather wonderful. Sorry, I can't show you that. Um, Britannia Coconut Dancers, of course, coming up shortly. And and I put that in. This is the the rip and sword dancers, uh, who don't dance at all. Uh, they do a, a traditional folk play, a mummers play, and these three characters actually play seven parts, and it's done in machine gun fire. It's quite extraordinary. So the whole performance takes place around three and a bit minutes, it's like, whereas normally it would take fifteen minutes, and they're off to the next venue. And on, in 1981, and Derek Schofield remember this, we uh, we actually documented 51 performances on, on Boxing Day. And as I say, that's another story. Saddleworth, Hansworth, of course, I was close neighbours to Hansworth when I lived in Sheffield and we did quite a lot um, together. Grenoside, again, Sheffield. Flamborough Sword, who are truly wonderful on Boxing Day. Uh, the the younger dancers, they still still have younger dancers, are absolutely immaculate and perfect in their stepping. And the and the guys themselves are just truly wonderful. They they seem to have six left feet, but it's the most magic of performance I've ever seen. Uh, Shropshire Bedlands, who of course have now change their, their facial attire and i'll finish on that one that's almost coming back to my home roots that's a that's a, a session we had in london with with um tommy orchard singing and stepping on the left there so um yeah okay thanks for your indulgence i'm not sure what we've done as ever but oh oh yes finally um uh, because somebody did, did ask me, did I dance? Well, I have danced with Abbots Bromley on their day. I also did a whole day with them at uh, Banbury um, Hobby Horse Festival once when they were short of a man. But this is my claim to fame in 1960, 59 or 60. Uh, apparently, I introduced the twist to um, to the, lo the local dance and Additionally, in more recent years, I've been the Heather man at, um, at Whitby Folk Week with Bill Crawford leading me on. And there I am dancing with the Britannia Coconut Dancers <laughs> and not bending as low as them because I would have fallen over. So with that, I take my leave. Okay, so if you stop screen, brilliant. Right, well, I have a, well, I have um, a pl proper applause at the end. Um, so, have anybody got any questions for Doc? Is there anything in the chat, Doc? Uh, sure, Luke. Probably not. But if if people would like to uh, ask a question, I'm sure you will. Um, then under reactions, there's raise hand, or you can just wave at me, and I might I might see you. I think the silence says it all. <laughs> nah. We usually get a few questions. <laughs> Derek, go on. Go on, Derek. Uh, a couple of things, Doc. Um yeah. a, a few weeks ago when I saw you, we were I, I mentioned something about Abbott's Bromley and the fact that they don't do the 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 forward and back. As uh, mm. as long as they used to, that they just do two steps, two steps and two steps back. But you could see in that film that the older film they were doing about four steps in and four steps back. So you can see that difference in what how they do it now and how they did it then. Yeah, it's interesting that um, when when outsiders come in and dance, they try to do a hop and skip. <laughs> uh, it usually means the two osses, the two horns clash together inevitably. But yeah, no, it's, it, it is interesting how that changed. Uh, similarly, looking at the, the footage of um, 
Padstow, the, the, that vernacular style of dancing, um, there, there, there used to be a kind of caressing, the hands doing this, you know, very close. And then in the, in the mid to late 60s, when the crowds became more intense, the hands were going further up, almost disco fashion. Uh, but it was because of the pressure of crowds, you know, and it, it's now creeping back to being a, a, a lower, a lower uh, action. Hmm. Also, um, I discovered a short while ago that I've got a small stash of those Padstow books, about oh, good. eight or ten, I think. <laughs> I don't know why, but <laughs> if you want them back or anybody wants a copy. Well, they, they sell few. they sell on eBay for ridiculous amounts. The last time, oh I right, okay, no, you can't have them back. Then. Forty-two <laughs> pounds, Derek, on one of them. Okay, I'll put them on eBay. Not then. saying anyone pay to buy that, but um, <laughs> yeah. And that Boxing Day with the Rip and Sword Dancers was the coldest day I can ever remember. Oh, I don't remember that. Freezing walking around. God. I think I was probably carrying too much equipment to feel the cold. It, it was great, wasn't it? <laughs> Very good. Yeah, the uh, the the Morris uh, Rip and Morris team now do the play, but they do it in the conventional manner. They they're not out to collect the money as these three guys were, or seven, uh, five of them actually, because two others were going around collecting. Um, but uh, they were. I, I I always I always say there were fifty one performances. In fact, there were fifty performances, but one of them took place at two o'clock, and it was noticeable that these guys who were really really pushing the, the pace to try and get as many venues and houses um, you know performed at uh, suddenly slowed down, and it seemed really strange. And then we went into this um, um, little square really and at the corner there was a betting office and they timed it to coincide with the two o'clock race at york and they, as soon as they went see me that the man rushed out with 25 quid and put it in the tin to stop them singing because he didn't want them he knew what was going to happen he didn't want them to interfere with the uh the the betting it was wonderful and i i treat that as a you know perfect performance really absolutely Peter? Okay, on mute, that's a good idea. Um, right, um, yeah, just following on from Ripon, um, yeah, we saw them a few years later and um, it amused us they were going up the street and we got to one, uh, one of the clubs um, and they said, oh, we're not going in there because they didn't give us any money last year, which we thought was quite amusing. And then we, we, we have seen them uh, since in, with, with the new version, the folky version, but there is a direct uh, connection between them. So uh, through Paul, who was the mayor of Ripon at the time, can't oh, remember his surname. Right, yeah. um, oh, uh, it always, I never understood why when he'd been out along with the old people, they'd turned it to the, um, the, the standard folky style of doing it. Yeah, you know what happened, of course, that, um, uh, what was he called? The, the the little oh dear my my brain I got too much going through to this last few days, but um, he he um, he he used to say so many times during that day I don't know if you remember Derek but he would say I was a Carol Levis discovery and I said I think a lot of you are old enough to remember Carol Levis uh, uh, discovery the, the, the sort of, the, rather like the, the early form of uh, Britain's Got Talent you know but he was on that playing the harmonica. And I thought, oh, yeah. And he had this tiny key ring harmonica, uh, but he played it with his nose. <laughs> so <laughs> no end of times during the day. So I don't know if I told you, but I used to, I was a Carol Evers discovery. But he was the one who in uh, 1985 or 86 walked off in a huff. So, um, oh, dear, Tony, Tony Chambers was left without a performer so his wife margaret stepped yeah, in yeah and oh, they did it they did the, the, the did it with um and margaret was actually a descendant of the daughter of the the previous um leader of the the uh, uh the troop if you can call them that you know before before tony took over um anyway um it was some someone i'll, I'll not mention the name who commented 
on this saying how awful it was that a woman should actually be taking part in a traditional performance. Same thing happened with Abbots Bromley at, um, at uh, Dancing England when Carl Dallas actually wrote up a piece and he wrote again exactly the same kind of tone. Uh, what a shame that they couldn't get a team together. They had to resort to having a girl in the team. Well, if he'd known there were regularly girls or wives and in the team, you know, particularly on the triangle or the bow and arrow, you know, they grew up into that. And, and, and nowadays it's kind of the, the clenched fist at the end of the day when the, the, the uh, Doug Fowles' daughter, six of them, uh, if they're there, they all take the horns and they dance and it's absolute magic, you know. It uh, really is the horn dance as we remember. I haven't, I haven't noted how many steps they take, Derek. I'll have to do that next time and see. Penny's got a hand up. Hiya, Penny. I thought it was you. Long time no see. Unmute yourself, Penny. Hold on. Can you unmute uh, yourself? Unmute. There we go. That's it. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Hello. Hello. Good to see you. Um, so I was just wondering, apart from it being lovely to see you, um, I was just wondering that Sheffield show that ended up being cancelled. How how soon after that was um, You know the the big show. I've, the name's gone now. The big show um, in Dan Dancing England. Dancing England. Thank oh no, you. Dancing Dancing England was already happening. Been happening for at least four years. I think seventy nine was the the first one. Was it Derek? Derek of the dates, we'll call him. He knows all the dates. Um, yeah, because I I was actually living in Brighton. Um, uh, when the first one came off, and and uh, and John, oh, and Derek, who was it? John, John, remember? Shaw. John oh, Shaw. Shaw. Yeah, John Shaw invited me and to Phil Heaton. And, and Phil Heaton, yeah, to, to put up an exhibition of my pictures, and and I I was actually working for Marks and Spencer at the time because of taking those odd jobs as I did, you know, away from teaching and art college and things. And um, I uh, I had a job of bailing all the rubbish boxes and things, and the the shirt the liners that came out of shirts was a beautiful white glossy card. So I got permission to keep those. And I still have stacks of them now, but those are the ones that my photographs were actually put on to mount onto the wall. So a little bit of nonsense. <clears throat> yeah. There was, there was the show in Sheffield that um, Roy Dyson's son was involved with. That was later on, wasn't it, when Dancing yeah. England had finished? Yeah. Well, Dancing England had that break, of course, and I think it was about three years ago they, they, they resurrected it in, in Sheffield. And then it went down mm. to Derby. Um, I don't know if there's been one last year or not. Don't think so. But it really was a showcase. I mean. Any more questions? Oh, Beth, go on. It's a very tiny point. I might be wrong, but in your um, Bampton film in the 60s, it looked right at the end. Was that Roy Dominic? Sorry, which film? The you showed a film of Bampton. Oh, the Bampton. I don't know. I, I wondered the about. End. Yes, I wondered about that as well. Because obviously, I didn't know Roy in 1963, but no, I've seen enough I, pictures I of him. I said I've given, I given a copy if... to uh, Reg Hall, who, who appears oh, yeah. there in it, and um, he he was able to mention one or two people. It just looked like yeah, what I remember from pictures. Me. I thought it looked like, I, I thought it was Roy as, yeah. as well, yeah. yeah. Anyway, it'd just be interesting. I didn't know him in 1962 either, though. <laughs> no, I've, I mean, I've got pictures. You said same thing, we thought it was Roy. Yeah. 
I'll have a look through because there are pictures of teams in the in the sixties with Roy in it. Mm. I know. Yeah. So I'll go to those at some point and have a look, and if it matches up, then that's him. Yeah. It's, a, it's about a thirty-minute film. It's a, it's quite well shot. Mm. Um, I mean, a lot of them. Is, I, I've, I've got an Abingdon one from nineteen sixty-four. Again, I've no. Is it, anyone recognise the film or know who may have shot it? Yeah. Somebody has obviously given it to me in the past. It was inside a box with loads of newspapers and things. I've been, uh, you know, the pandemic has been useful in that way that I haven't been out and uh, adding anything to uh, the collection. But it's meant I've had time to sort through stray boxes and digitize things. Uh, More questions? Oh, I think you might get an early glass of wine, everybody. So if um if we could every un unmute yourself, yeah, Doc's already started. Uh, if you could all unmute yourselves and um, we'll give them a massive round of applause, please. Give me a couple of seconds. There. Thank you for all the, all the memories. Uh, we've got the memories, but you've got the photographs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um... It's, it's frustrating, really, because there, there were some I some really nice, you know, images that I, I'd like to put up, but they weren't appropriate because it slows things down. As it was, you know, there's far too many there anyway. But uh, uh, well, there is a there is a project. I mean, I don't know. Um, I did notice a Barbara there, and I don't know if it's Barbara that I know. I think she's left. Actually, she's left. Oh, might well be there. She sent you a nice note. It might well be. <laughs> she sent you a nice note to me, but then she left. Oh, right. OK. Well, Barbara Santi is a filmmaker who lives down in Cornwall. And um, obviously, I've known her for several years, get back and forth to Padstow. And just before the pandemic, um, I had this idea of returning all of the old photographs, my photographs and, any, and video, all back down to, to Cornwall. And so we, we set this up as a project. It was going to be pretty costly, as you can imagine, um, not, not just in terms of time, but, but money as well. And, and Barbara applied to Lottery, Heritage Lottery, as well as some local funding. Mm -hmm. And we managed last October, November to get the funding. So for the next two and a half years, I'm involved in returning all of the Padstow material back to Cornwall. It's going to be lodged at the Crescent Kernow, the, the, the new um, up-to-date um, archive in Red Ruth. Uh, they're doing some of the digitising. I've already got the 8 mil film being digitised. Um, the A lot of the video stuff's already been digitised by me. I've just taken <laughs> down to London two days ago, which uh, was an effort. Um, uh, something like two and a half thousand transparencies in a huge box to give to somebody who lives in London from Padstow, who's taking them down either this weekend or next. Uh, he was very fearful of having this, as he called them, the, uh, you know, the, 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 this sacred grove of material. Um, so they're all going down to be digitised. And, and the idea is then we'll, we've got local people on on zoom already uh going to be taking part in um what's the word curating and, and acknowledging and recognizing the material and the joy for me of course is that, that a lot of the younger people and when i say younger they're like 39 to 50 <clears throat> um they're going to be looking and listening to the grandparents that I recorded in the 60s and 70s. And that to me is, you know, that that's, um, it doesn't matter about anything else. That's just, just joyful. So it's all happening. So we, um, yeah, so it started um, last week, really. Uh, I went down to Padstow in November and interestingly showed, a, took over a, the social club for two days and people came in and what was fascinating, I showed um, a two and a half hour VHS film of 1989 and it went down a storm. 
and the next batch of people who came in asked deliberately asked for the same film to be shown and and that's all over two days we just showed that one clip first time i'd seen it in fact because i never look at this stuff as some of you may know um but the it, it it had it was the first time somebody had left school the first time they'd lost their virginity or rather say the time they lost their virginity i don't think you can lose it the first time can you anyway um the uh, first time they got drunk first time they went under the arse you know and so on and so forth it was the first time for everyone now if all those other films uh, uh, contain that sort of information you know it's an absolute winner and we're going to be exhausted by the response but at the end of the day there will be uh, we will curate i've learned that word you will curate material that will go online so it will be available for everybody um There'll be uh, material going to the local museum, which will be available by push button and so on and so forth. So there's a lot to do. Mm. So you heard it here first or second. You're never going to stop doing things, are you? Uh, well, who knows? <laughs> Slowing down. Slow down. The, um, the Padstow musicians came up to Swindon in the late 70s uh, and performed an evening at Swindon Folk Singers Club. And that's a, a great memory of those days. I've never been to Padstow myself, but I've, I've heard, them see, heard them do all yeah, well, Reg, Reg Hall also played with the Blue Ribbonos for many years. He went in 1954 and um, you know, stood back as as I would, would as well. I mean, I, I never wear whites on the day because I, you know, I'm not Padster and I think that's well respected. But um, yeah, he he was there and, and within the first year they, they knew the word had gone round him and Mervyn Plunkett and he was playing with them and he, he joined in and uh, right up into, oh, crikey, the late 90s, Reg went down there. And he won't believe me when I say, um, you know, people always say, how is Reg? Oh, no, they wouldn't know me. And of course, they do. People remember, even the youngsters, you know, the 15-year-olds who weren't around then, they, they, they all, they've all heard of Reg Hall and they, you know, know what a man he was. So, and I know Reg is coming up for 90 soon, so... Uh, it must have been in the mid-80s. Uh, the... Um... <laughs> Somerset Morris men were invited to go over to the Loire Valley uh, through twinning and they took Minehead Horse on his first ever trip abroad. He performed in the Corn Exchange in Blois. Yeah, they, they've, 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 um, they've become more um, <coughs> more outward recently as well. They've, they've, they've even made a, an obby, uh, John, John Land has made an obbyos for uh, this exhibition in Compton Verney. So they've actually given Simon Costin, Museum of British Folklore, an actual obbyos, a hobby horse rather, to keep. But um, yeah, it, it, again, it's fascinating because in the in the old days, the, the Padso obbyos would go out. They went to the uh, Albert Hall a couple of times, of course, in the 50s. Uh, but, but I've got photographs of them in Truro and, and Chagford in Devon because they used to go up and uh, uh, Charlie Bate was a mate of um, Bob Cann, who I mentioned earlier. So they would come up uh, as a party, as they call themselves, uh, but as a proper party to Chagford and, and, you know, they went out. But but 20 years ago, if you mentioned that to any of the uh, Padstow mayors, they would, oh, no, no, they're indignant. It never did, never did. Um, so it's quite, it's quite interesting how um, you know, history is kept. Yeah. Anyway, look. Thank you, thank you, folks, for uh, for, for <laughs> listening to the the, the, the garbage. Uh, well, thank you very much for coming. Thank you, Doc, for speaking. Thank you very much, everyone, for coming. And we'll see you at another event. Our last event is next weekend, where we got Mike Heaney taking part of his book. He's not going to cover his entire book in one session, which would be clearly impossible. Anyway. Okay, so see you next time.